I want to talk to you tonight about the subject, I'm not satisfied. Look at your neighbor and say, I'm not satisfied. Amen. And as we sang that song, I thought it fit so well into the message tonight. And uh, I have taught in youth class for the last couple of years. I think, uh, you know, believe it or not, right up until the last printed bulletin that we did, it actually still said Pastor Matt Woodward's name for the Sunday morning youth class slot. But that's where I was. I, I wasn't skipping church every Sunday morning. Uh, just in case you were wondering, I, I was here in the youth wing. I'm not satisfied. Would you just pray with me and just open up your heart and your mind to receive from the word? And uh, I just want to be a vessel tonight that God speaks through. I don't even know what else to say. I just want to let my heart out tonight what God has given me. Is that all right? Why don't we pray one more time? Lord Jesus, Lord, I thank you for your presence that we feel in this room tonight. And we understand and we know through your word that you are everywhere present and nowhere absent. So, Lord, we just ask that as we dive into your word and as we lift you up in prayer, Lord, as we lift you up in worship, as we glorify your name in this house, that you would just begin to reveal more of yourself in this place to us tonight, Jesus. God, I pray that there would be a stirring in the heart of every person in this room. God, that there would be a stirring in our spirits tonight for something greater than we've ever had, something deeper than we've ever experienced. That's my prayer tonight, and that's my heartbeat tonight. And God, I pray that that will be contagious in this room. God, that there will be this hunger. God, that there will be this desire for something greater, not only tonight, but every service to come, greater in our prayer meetings, greater in our youth services. God, we're hungry for more tonight. We're hungry for more tonight. Amen. Thank you so much for praying and, and worshiping. You may be seated. And, uh, you know, I'm really going to try and let my heart and my passion out. I preached this message about a year ago to our youth group and really have, have felt this in my spirit for the last year and a half. And uh, it, it just felt natural as I was asking the Lord, you know, what to talk about, that this would be the subject. Um, because I've been talking about this with a lot of people for a year and a half or so now. And it's this subject of, I'm not satisfied. Look at your neighbor one more time and say, I'm not satisfied. There was an author, Jim Collins. He is also an American researcher, speaker, and he is a consultant focused on the subject of business management and company sustainability and growth. And he authored books such as Turning the Flywheel, Built to Last, Great by Choice, how the Mighty Fall, Beyond Entrepreneurship, and is also most widely known for his 2001 writing of the book, Good to Great. And I read this book a few years ago, and it wasn't, the book doesn't even really have a spiritual implication to it. I read it for uh, my work and, and my job and really just wanted to understand these principles that Jim Collins teaches. But as I began to get into the book, I realized that his book was more than about business. And he opens his book with this statement. He says, good is the enemy of great. And that is one of the key reasons why we have so little in our world today that becomes great. We don't have great schools, principally because we have good schools. We don't have great government, principally because we have good government. Few people attain great lives in large part because it is just so easy to settle for a good life. And as I read these words, you know, I, I work in the automotive industry, and I was like, yeah, this is good, I understand, that's nice, but, but it really spoke to my spirit, and I read the book a couple times over the last couple years, and I just, I just can't get away from this concept of, of satisfy, being satisfied with what is good. And so I would expound upon what Jim Collins said, and I would tell you that good is not the stepping stone to becoming great but it is really the stumbling block that we can all fall into every once in a while. We are so blessed. Look around us. We're so blessed. We have a big church. We have a great church. We have, we have good services. We have good music. All of these things. We have good worship. We have good preaching. We have good music. We have good prayer meetings. We've got good conventions and conferences that we go to. We've got good revival weekends in a normal year. <laughs> okay. 
But sometimes we also fall into the trap of settling for what is good and never going after the things that are greater that God has in store for us. And I want to be the first to declare tonight that I'm not satisfied with just having good church. I want to have great church. I don't want to have good worship services. I want to have great worship services. I don't want to have good prayer meetings, but I want to have great prayer meetings. I don't want just a good youth group, but I want a great youth group. I don't want just a good church fellowship. I want great church fellowship. I'm not willing to satisfy and settle for something that is lesser than what God has in store for me and for you and for us as a church. And if you believe that, would you say amen? Amen. Amen. Preceding the book of 1 Samuel, the nation of Israel was in chaos. There was no leader. The Israelites had all but forgotten about God once again. Sin is running rampant, and the people were following after their own wicked and sinful desires. And it was a season of lawlessness in their history. In the book of Judges, the final chapter in the final verse wraps it all up, and it says this. Judges chapter 21, verse 25. In those days, there was no king in Israel, and every man did that which was right in his own eyes. Sounds like the world that we live in on occasion. A world of lawlessness where good is evil and evil becomes good. And that was the state of their nation at that time. But when we skip over the book of Ruth and we go to 1 Samuel chapter 1, verses 1 through 18, it says this. Now there was a certain man of Ramath, Aim Zophim. I've been writing these down for um, uh, baby names. That one didn't make the cut. (laughs) Of Mount Ephraim, and his name was Elkanah, the son of Jeroham, the son of Elihu, the son of Tohu, the son of Zuf, an Ephrathite. And also none of those names made the list so far. And he had two wives, which I would not recommend. The name of the one was Hannah. I just had to get a little humor in there just for a second. I made that joke in youth, and and nobody laughed because nobody understood it. It's, uh, Pastor Matt is my witness. He's not here tonight. But when you tell jokes in youth, um, the kids, they, they just stare at you. And they, they, they don't say anything. They don't laugh. They don't smile. Nothing. But thank you for uh, indulging this humor. He had two wives, and the name of the one was Hannah, and the name of the other was Peninnah. And Peninnah had children, but Hannah had no children. And this man went up, went up out of his city yearly to worship and to sacrifice unto the Lord of hosts in Shiloh. And the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, the priests of the Lord, were there. And when the time was that Elkanah offered, he gave to Peninnah his wife and to all her sons and her daughters portions. But unto Hannah he gave a worthy portion, for he loved Hannah, but the Lord had shut up her womb. And her adversary, being Peninnah, also provoked her sore to make For to make her fret because the Lord had shut up her womb. And as he did so year by year, when she went up to the house of the Lord, so she provoked her. Therefore she wept and did not eat. The New Living Translation says that she was reduced to tears. Year after year when Elkanah would go to the temple to make sacrifice and he would give the portions to his wives and their children, Peninnah would provoke Hannah and taunt her for being barren, for being childless. And she would be reduced to tears year after year. She would go to the temple when all this was going on and she would cry. Because it was so painful for her to see this happening around her. Then said Elkanah, her husband to her, verse 8. Hannah, why weepest thou? And why eatest thou not? And why is thy heart grieved? He goes on to say this. He says, am I not better than ten sons? Not being very sensitive to the issue. Hannah being barren. And him saying, am I not better than ten children? I can't tell if it's the men or the women snickering in the room right now. Am I not better to you than having ten sons? So Hannah rose up after they had eaten in Shiloh and after they had drunk. Now Eli the priest sat upon the seat 
by post of the temple of the Lord. And Hannah was in bitterness of soul and prayed unto the Lord, and she wept sore. She was in bitterness of soul and prayed unto the Lord and wept sore. Year after year, she was reduced to tears. Year after year, she would go to the temple and she would cry when Peninnah, her adversary, would taunt her. But after so many years, tears weren't enough. And after such a long time, it wasn't enough for her just to sulk and to cry about what she didn't have. But Hannah decided that she had to pray about it. And she vowed a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if thou wilt indeed look upon the affliction of thine handmaid and remember me, and not forget thine handmaid, but wilt give unto thy handmaid a man-child, then I will give him unto the Lord all the days of his life, and there shall no razor come upon his head. And it came to pass, as she continued praying before the Lord, that Eli marked her mouth. Now Hannah, she spake in her heart, only her lips moved, but her voice was not heard. Therefore, Eli thought she had been drunken. And Eli said unto her, said unto her, how long will you be drunk and put away wine from thee? And Hannah answered and said, no, my Lord, I'm a woman of a sorrowful spirit. I'm not drunk. I've not had wine or strong drink, but I'm pouring out my soul before the Lord. I'm pouring out my soul before the Lord and count not thine handmaid for a daughter of Belial, for out of the abundance of my complaint and grief have I spoken. Hitherto, and then Eli answered and said, Go in peace, and the God of Israel grant thee thy petition that thou hast asked of him. And she said, Let thine handmaid, handmaid find grace in thy sight. So the woman went her way and did eat, and her countenance was no more sad. Like I already said, this was a lawless time in Israel. There was no king. There was nobody ruling them. There was chaos. Sin was running rampant. And because of this, the customs of the world had crept its way into the camp of Israel and even into the ministry of the priesthood. And they lived double standard lives. They would still go to the temple, but when they left the temple, they lived like everybody else around them did. They had one foot in the world and one foot in the church, so to speak. And this is important to understand because Elkanah wasn't just a certain man as the Bible calls him. Second Chronicles chapter 6 tells us that Elkanah was actually a priest. He was only supposed to have one wife, but the customs of the world in that day allowed that if a man's wife was barren, that he could marry another in order to continue his lineage and have children. And so that's what Elkanah did. Even though he loved Hannah, he also married Peninnah so she could provide children for him. In 1 Samuel chapter 1, verse 5 that we just read, it says that the Lord didn't give Hannah any children. And we can understand through the scripture that children in the Bible are said to be gifts from God. So it was God that would allow or disallow this to happen in Hannah's life. Psalms chapter 127, verse 3, it says, Children are a gift from God. And so by taking Peninnah to be his wife, Elkanah was unwilling to wait on the Lord to provide a child through his first wife. What he was doing now is birth, birthing more people into this, this lineage, birthing more people into this generation who were not willing to wait on the promises of the Lord. And Hannah and Peninnah, even though they lived in the same household, they became bitter rivals. And the Bible tells us that she would taunt her year after year after year. And regularly, Hannah would be reduced to tears and she would cry. But the crying never fixed the problem. The sulking never fixed the problem. The complaining never fixed the problem. Year after year after year. And even though we understand that Elkanah took on these, these rituals of the world, so to speak, by marrying two women, uh, we understand that he would still travel to Shiloh yearly to make these sacrifices. And so here is Hannah. She's now in a situation where Peninnah is regularly taunting her. The Bible says that she was always reduced to tears by her continual taunting. Hannah couldn't stop crying. But why would the Lord do such a thing to Hannah? Speculation, you can't prove it, but if you study it and you read it, some believe that the Lord allowed Hannah to be barren and to be taunted by Peninnah because Hannah had become too comfortable with being barren. 
Hannah had become too comfortable in her present condition. So maybe, maybe just maybe God allowed Peninnah to come in and taunt her to provoke her to change and get her out of her comfort zone. It's not always, you know, we like, we like to point fingers when we have problems in life. It's like, it's like it's always the devil that's after us, you know. The devil this and the devil that and the devil gave me a flat tire. And whatever it is, we blame everything on the devil. He doesn't deserve half the credit that we give him sometimes. Sometimes God is just putting something in our life to provoke us to change. And so even though it hurt for a long time, for years, we don't know the exact length of time, but for years we understand that Hannah, she wasn't willing to make this change. Year after year she would cry. But it took years and years of this taunting, tears, before she decided to run to the temple of the Lord and pray. And just because something hurts and it's uncomfortable doesn't mean that we always want to change. When it comes to the things of God and when it comes to this lack of satisfaction, we only really want change. We only really want to see things happen when we're willing to put our actions behind our words and do something about it. And so Hannah gets to this place where she couldn't help herself. And she just runs to the temple and she falls down and begins to pray and cry out to God and say, God, if you would just give me a child, I'll give him back. I don't even need to keep him. But God, I can't, I can't live in this state of barrenness. I can't live in this state of emptiness anymore. I need something. And it took her running to the temple and praying. And crying was never enough. Finally, there was a day, there was a year when Hannah was taunted so bad that it hurt so much that she had to run to the temple and pray. You ever been there before? You're going through life and things are coming at you. And it just seems like one day it's just like you reach the tipping point and you've just got to run to God and say, God, I don't know what to do, but I need you. Have you ever been there before? And so Hannah gets to this place where she's not satisfied with her situation. Year after year, she did nothing about it but cry. But finally, she turned to the Lord and decided to pray. And meanwhile, here comes Elkanah asking, Hannah, am I not better than 10 sons? Elkanah, represents the things in our life that would try and hold us down. The things that once used to be good. The things that we once used to care about once was valuable. And it sticks and it holds on to you and it brings you down when you're trying to get somewhere further. Everyone has an Elkina. Don't look at the person beside you. Everyone has an Elkina. It doesn't mean that it's a person but it might just be something that pulls you down every, try, every time you try to reach for something further. And surely, at one point, we can understand that Elkanah probably was enough for Hannah. They were newlyweds at one point, and they wanted to enjoy life together. They talked about maybe having a family, and they just wanted to enjoy these moments until that day came. But there came a time when Hannah was no longer satisfied with what she had. She wanted something greater. And I can tell you tonight that the, my heartbeat is that I'm not satisfied. I can't settle anymore for what is good. I want to go after something greater. Is there anybody with me tonight? Yes. We can't get distracted with the Elkanahs in our life. God wants to get us out of our place where we've made peace with barrenness and emptiness and unfruitfulness. And God will use the pinnas of this world to taunt us, to push us to something greater. We can't be satisfied with Elkanah because if you read through the book of 1 Samuel and you realize that Hannah was the mother of Samuel, And maybe that doesn't mean a lot when I just say it right now, but please understand with me who Samuel was. 
Samuel was a revivalist in his day. He was the crossover between the judges and the king. Samuel was the one that anointed Saul. Samuel was the one that anointed David. Here is this prophet that if Hannah had just been satisfied, there would have been no revival. Samuel was a judge and a prophet in Israel who literally led Israel to a revival and a restoration in their land. Hannah's prayer brought down a revival. Hannah's prayer brought change, not only to her household, but it brought change to the world around her. God's looking for people who are no longer satisfied, people who aren't content with what we've always had. We've had good church services. We've had good prayer meetings and all of these things, but I am not satisfied yet. I'm not satisfied. Please hear my heart tonight. I'm not satisfied. I don't want to become so complacent and, and comfortable. I said to Pastor Jack a couple weeks ago, I said, sometimes I just, sometimes we, we're not always in this boat. I just wish prayer meeting would start at seven and let it finish when it finishes. Be just me here, apparently. I'm just kidding. I'm not saying, I said, I'm not saying that we got to be here till 1045 every Friday night. But if God's moving, I don't want to shut it down. I don't want to leave if the presence of God is in the room. I'm not satisfied. Look at your neighbor and say, I'm not satisfied. There's a story in the book of Acts that haunts me when I think about it. And when I read about it, when we go to John chapter 11, verse 18, first, in the New Living, it says, Bethany was only a few miles down the road from Jerusalem. Bethany was just a small village. It was just a short distance from Jerusalem. It's where Mary broke her alabaster box and washed the feet of Jesus. It's where Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. And to this day, Bethany is called the place of Lazarus in many parts of the world. But most importantly, this is where Jesus ascended to heaven after his resurrection in Luke chapter 24, verse 50. Bethany is the place that Jesus spoke his final words before leaving earth and commissioning them to go to the upper room to wait for the promise of the Holy Ghost. And when we go to the book of Acts, chapter 1, verses 1 to 5, it says, The former treaties have I made, the, uh, made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach until the day in which he was taken up after that he through the Holy Ghost, had given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom also he showed himself alive. After his passion, by many infallible proofs, being seen of them forty days, and speaking of things pertaining to the kingdom of God, and being assembled together with them, commanded them that they would not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, Ye have heard of me. For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days. Hence, that's the opening of the book of Acts. That's what we cling to. This book of Acts church that we are a part of. But when we skip down to verse 15 of the same chapter, Acts chapter 1 verse 15, it says, And in those days Peter stood up in the midst of the disciples and said, But the number of names together were about 120. Please remember that. The number of the people there were 120. We know them as those that were in the upper room. In Acts chapter 2, when the Holy Ghost was poured out for the first time, these are the 120 who are all in one accord, in one place, with one purpose in mind. And these are the 120 that in one day had a 3,000 soul revival. These are the 120 that they sold all their possessions and divided them equally amongst themselves. These are the 120 who were the pioneers of the apostolic church that we are a part of today. And these are the 120 people that are put in the limelight when we look through the book of Acts, often causing us to overlook one small fact. And it is this. There were 500 people who were commissioned by Jesus to go to Jerusalem at his ascension in Bethany. There was 120 people in the upper room. But there was 500 people when Jesus was there after he rose from the dead and he spoke to them and they saw miracles and, and they saw him. He was alive. 500. But somewhere we lose 380 people. Can you imagine? 
knowing that Jesus died, knowing that he's been crucified, put in the tomb, and all of a sudden you bump into him at Starbucks, and he says, go here, and you say, maybe sometime else. Not today. I'm too busy. I've got too much going on. I've got to go to work. There was 500 people. Please hear me. There was 500 people that were there, but there was only 120 that made it to the upper room. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 to 6, it says, Let me now remind you, dear brothers and sisters, of the good news. I preached to you before. You welcomed it then, and you still stand firm. And it is the good news that saves you if you continue to believe the message I told you, unless, of course, you believed something that was never true in the first place. I pass on to you what was most important when it also been passed on to me. Christ died for our sins, just as the Scripture said, but he was buried. He was raised from the dead on the third day, just as the Scripture said in verse 5. He was seen by Peter. And then by the 12, and after that, he was seen by more than 500 of his followers. These weren't just 500 random people. These were 500 people that were called followers of Jesus. And somewhere, the vast majority of them didn't make it to the upper room. 380 didn't make it. For whatever reason, they missed out on the outpouring of the Holy Ghost. 380 people were too busy. 380 people had something more important to do. 380 people didn't make the trip from Bethany to the upper room that was only just a couple miles away. This was no random group. These were followers. They were referred to as followers in the scripture. They saw Jesus after he rose from the dead. And they were there. Some of them were there even when he ascended into heaven. But they didn't make it for whatever reason. Bethany, its name meant house of unripe figs or house of misery because of its lonely location facing away from the city. Bethany represents unfulfilled potential. This unripeness, this house of unripe figs, it's unfulfilled potential. And so how appropriate is it that these 380 people missed out on the most critical moment in history, the birth of the church to stay in Bethany, this place of unfulfilled potential. And please don't miss the point tonight. Because you can follow Jesus, you can call yourself a Christian, but you could still live a life of unfulfilled potential. And I refuse to be part of a Bethany church. I refuse to be a part of a Bethany youth group. There is so much potential in the house tonight. We can't even comprehend, we can't even fathom what God could do with some of us in this room tonight. We can't even understand it. Think as far and as deep as you can and you don't even scratch the surface of what God can do through you. But here they are, living, satisfied with whatever's going on around them, satisfied with whatever else they had going on, living this life of unfulfilled potential. We can come back to the music tonight. Living this life of unfulfilled potential. Often in my personal prayer time, I've repented and said, God, I'm sorry for the moments that I wasn't plugged in enough. God, I'm sorry for maybe the days that went by that I didn't, that I didn't read your word. God, I'm sorry for the, the couple days in a row that I didn't find time to pray because there was something else that was more important. And God forbid... Because I lacked that discipline. God forbid because I lacked to set aside that time that I wasn't sensitive to the Spirit of God enough to hear Him calling. Go talk to that person. Why don't you send that person a message? I'm not satisfied. There's a book by Leonard Ravenhill. It's called Why Revival Tarries. And regardless of whether you like reading or not, if you really want to get messed up spiritually in a good way, you should go buy this book. I've read it on multiple occasions. 
I just gave a copy to Daniel to read. I just ordered four more copies just to give out because of the principles in this book. But he goes on to say this, no man is greater than his prayer life. I'm sorry. No man is greater than his prayer life. The pastor who is not praying is playing. The people who are not praying are straying. We've got many organizers, but we have few agonizers. I'm trying to hold myself together. We've got many players and payers, but we've got few prayers. We've got many singers, but we have few clingers. We've got lots of pastors, but we've got few wrestlers. We've got many fears, but we've got few tears. We've got much fashion, but we've got little passion. We've got many interferers, but we've got few intercessors. Many writers, but few fighters. Failing here, we fail everywhere. And every time I read it, it just shakes me. To think that I could get to a place in my life where I'm so satisfied with work, with family, with money, whatever it is. We all have our different challenges. But that I would neglect to pray. That the world around me would make me so numb. That when I walk into the house of God, I've got no desperation. I've got no hunger. I've got no drive for anything greater. But I want you to understand tonight that I'm not satisfied. And I believe that there are people in this church that are not satisfied with having a good church. We have a good church. We've got good. We've got good written everywhere in this church. But God is calling us to something greater. He's calling us to something greater. It feels like every sermon I listen to, whether it's in this pulpit or another, there is this call. There is this lack of satisfaction in the world around us that nothing I can do in life will ever get me to a place where I feel satisfied. Except for when I'm in the house of God. Matthew chapter 13, and I will close in a minute. Matthew chapter 13, verses 44 to 46. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure that a man discovered hidden in a field. In his excitement, he hid it again. He went and he sold everything that he owned enough to get just enough money to buy the field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant on the lookout for choice pearls. When he discovered a pearl of great value, he sold everything that he had. He gave it all up. And he went and he bought it. Because he found something that was more important than what he had. And just like Hannah, you know, every once in a while crying feels good. Sometimes it feels terrible. Crying in front of you, I don't feel good right now. But Hannah, year after year after year, was reduced to tears. Church, hear me. We can come to service and we can have good services. We can have good worship sets, good preaching, because we do. We've got all of that. But if all that provokes in us is this emotional reaction that makes me want to change, but I never do anything about it when I leave this building, we'll never get there. And I know, I know, I understand. I don't think that you're all complacent. I know that you hunger for deeper things. I know that I do. I can feel it. Everybody I talk to, they say the same thing. I just, I just can't do this. It doesn't even have anything to do with COVID. 
It has nothing to do with that. It has nothing to do with getting back to what normal is. It's just that I can't just come to church and check in at 6 and check out at 7.30. I can't do it. I can't do it. I'm not satisfied standing with me tonight. I can recall moments. I can recall moments in my life. I don't know what it was, but when I went to bed last night, I just saw these moments of time where God felt so strong. I can remember when one of our former youth pastors, Rick Long, my uncle, took us to Hampton just for a small weekend getaway. And I can remember those services, no music, but just spending hours listening to the word and praying. I can remember services when our former youth pastor, Justin McKenzie, who was here on Sunday, minister, where service lingered and time didn't matter because we had found something more valuable. I can remember when Pastor Matt preached about having boldness. I can remember when Pastor Mike preached in youth a letter from hell that as a young man it shook me to think that I walk into work and to school every day, people not knowing Jesus and knowing that that's the only thing that they'll find satisfaction in. I can remember Josh you leading a worship night in youth and the presence of God just exploding. I don't even know what other way to put it. Where time didn't matter and we just lingered in the presence of God because we had found something that was more valuable and important. Josh, I can remember you preaching at Green Hill about intercessory prayer and how sometimes you've just got to dig in and use your voice and let it go. And I can remember those services. I can remember coming back from Montreal on a bus after a youth weekend and at the time thinking everybody was crazy because they wanted to start a prayer meeting in the middle of the night on the bus trip back from Montreal to Fredericton. And then prayer went from the next row to the next row to the next row to the next row. And soon there was a whole bus full of young people praying and crying and interceding in a bus. And when we pulled up to the church, I'll never forget it. There was kids slain out in the spirit. There was kids so drunk in the spirit that we had to grab them by their hands, both hands. Somebody on the other end, both feet. And we had to stumble through the aisle of the bus and down the staircase. And we had to open both back doors of their parents' car and we had to put them in because they couldn't walk. That was a prayer meeting on a bus. I remember those moments. I remember going to Miller Lake and having no idea where two hours went in the altar. When I got up, there was a puddle of sweat spit and mucus on the floor concrete floor just laid there for hours didn't know what else to do because in that moment I had found something greater Pastor Jack I can remember you preaching years ago spring up oh well we've got to pull out the tent pegs as well we've got to enlarge the tent because there's more people coming Pastor Woodward I can remember you preaching about the Joshua generation when I was so young and I can still remember those sermons and I can hear those moments in my mind. And those were all so good. Those moments were all so great. I wouldn't trade them for the world. But if there was a moment that was greater and if there was a moment that was deeper and if there was something else that I could go after, I'd give it all up just for one more experience in the presence of God. And so I close with this statement I'm not satisfied 
And if that is your heart's cry tonight, would you just lift your hands wherever you are in this building? I'm not trying to invoke an emotional reaction out of you, but I am asking you to pray. King Jesus, King Jesus, I'm sorry for everything I put before you. I'm sorry for all the time I spent on social media. God, I'm sorry for the times I rushed out of your presence because I felt like I was too busy to stay. God, let there be a hunger in this room that arises. God, let it arise in our spirit. God, let this hunger arise in our spirit. God, we're not satisfied with what we've had. God, we're going after greater tonight. Would you let your voice out tonight? Would you just let God know how hungry you really are tonight? God, I'll give you my full attention tonight. God, would you just reveal yourself to us in this room? God, as we lift you up. God, as we sing your praises. God, as we speak your name. God, as we seek your face. God, would you just begin to reveal yourself to us in this house tonight? God, let there be a fresh fire. God, let it reignite that soul that is barren. God, that soul that is empty. God, that soul that is hungry. God, let that fire of the Holy Ghost fall in each and every one of us. Let it refill us. Let it refresh us. Let it revive us. God, let it push us past tears, but push us to prayer. That's it, church. I'm not trying to push you for the world, but would you just push in for a minute? Would you just dig in for a minute? This is the most important thing on my calendar for today. It's just being in the presence of the Lord. Jesus, we're hungry for you. God, I don't want to stop at that, that labor. God, I don't want to stop at the pillars. God, I don't want to stop at the table of showbread. I don't want to stop at the candlestick. I don't want to stop at the altar of incense. God, I want to walk into the holy of holies and feel your presence. Lord, we're not satisfied. We're not satisfied with you just showing up on Sunday. God, we need you to show up on Monday, Tuesday. Lord, we're not satisfied with just going with the crowd, with just being lukewarm. But God, there is such a desire in this room for greater. I'll say one last thing before I turn this microphone over. It was about a year and a half ago, just before Youth Explosion 2019, as I had all of this kind of placed on my heart, that as I was in prayer, the Lord showed me or spoke to me, not in an audible voice, but just as I was praying, he quickened me. And he said, I'm looking for a generation of people that are seeking a suddenly. I'm looking for people that are seeking a suddenly moment because there was 500 that received the word. There was 120 that showed up, but they didn't know how long it was going to take. And the Lord said, if you want to have Book of Acts experiences, I'm looking for people who are seeking a suddenly. And to even say it out loud, it doesn't even make sense. How can I seek something when I don't know when it's going to happen? But God is looking for people in this generation, in this church, and in this youth group 
that every day we'll just seek after him because you never know what praying about that issue one more time might yield. It was Daniel, pardon me for not having the scriptural reference, but when he prayed that the messenger angel came to him and he said, Daniel, I heard you pray on day one, but it took me 21 days to get here because I was battling the prince of Persia. Referencing not a man, but a spirit. That even when Daniel prayed on day one and the Lord released what Daniel was looking for, it took 21 days of prayer. It took 21 days of fasting for that message to get to him. God isn't withholding revival. God doesn't withhold anything good from us, but he's looking for people who are willing to go after it. He's looking for people who are willing to seek for it. He's looking for people that are willing on a Monday night, on a Tuesday night, on a Thursday night, on a Friday night, on a Saturday morning to kneel down in prayer and say, God, I'm not satisfied. He's looking for people that are waiting for that suddenly moment that no long, no matter how long it takes, I'm going to wait in that upper room for that promise. No matter how long it takes, I'm going to keep on praying and waiting for that answer. No matter how long it takes, I'm going to keep on knocking. I'm going to keep on seeking. I'm going to keep on searching for what I'm looking for. I'm not satisfied. Amen. Would you lift your voice in prayer as I turn this back over tonight?